and welcome to Redacted Tonight VIP. I'm Naomi Caravani, guest hosting this week, and I am totally not going to cry. I'm not lonely. You're lonely. You know what? I never liked ghosts before, but now I would just love to have a spirit from the nether world haunt my home. I mean, I've tried inviting them. I've tried the Ouija board, candles, pentagrams, but I can never hear any creaks or moans or chains rattling. I'm starting to wonder, am I scaring the ghosts away? Well, we have one heck of a show for you tonight. Lee Camp has a very important interview for you today. He spoke with Angelica Duenas. She's a mother, an activist, a sexual assault survivor, a mutual aid volunteer, a former Bernie Sanders delegate, and she's running for Congress in California. So many important issues to discuss with her. Also on this episode, I talk about the drug company holding the country hostage, and correspondent Anders Lee will get into some mind-blowing old news about the Greek Revolution. But first, here's Lee Camp with Angelica Duenas. Take a look. Angelica, thanks for being here. Thank you so much for having me. So, you've got a lot going on right now. You're the mother of five children. Your husband has been laid off due to the pandemic. I, I think for many Americans, you're living the common American experience right now. Loss of income, insecurity, uh, watching trillions of dollars go to Wall Street and big banks while most people don't see a dime of it. Can you just start off by talking about what the experience has been like for you and your family recently? Well, I would say that honestly, it's been rough. Um, I have, like you mentioned, five kids. Four of them are students. And um, so we are doing the, you know, homeschool thing. And it's been quite an experience. Two of them are in junior high and two of them are in elementary school. And um, it's been quite a handful. On top of that, um, the insecurity of most of this time of not having any income. Uh, finally, my husband got his unemployment after seven weeks of being off work. Wow. Um, so we're hoping that that'll stay steady. Um, it has, it wasn't, you know, all of the seven weeks. So I'm not sure how that's going to work. Um, we're still trying to figure it out. Um, thankfully, also, um, you know, the stimulus uh, package came through. Um, which and still, it, it's a slap in the face compared to um, what these billionaires and billionaires and these corpor mega corporations got in return. Um, but and I'll be honest, like it, it kept us from you know literally being out in the streets. Um, but that's not that's that's really a, a minimum standard that uh, our country can do better. Um, I think that that we are lucky too because we got the stimulus package. Um, a lot sooner than other people. There's people still today that haven't received it yet. And I can only imagine how, how their situation is. So I feel myself that I'm fortunate um, because under the circumstances, we were able to, to make our, our, our bills this time around, but that's not going to be it. I mean, with $1,200, um, how far can that go? Yeah. So it's been quite um, like a gymnastics, you know what I mean? We've been trying to figure out how we're going to make this work. Yeah, it, it really is. It's breadcrumbs compared to what's going to massive corporations. Uh, it, it really is, like you said, a slap in the face. You told me before over email that you've had to do something you never thought you would, which is be in the, the bread lines to get food for your family. I think a lot of Americans are in that position right now. You know, they've worked hard their whole lives. They've been an important part of their communities. And now when a crisis hits, everything is so tenuous. It all breaks down and there's very little safety net. Why do you think that is? Why, why do you think so many Americans are in the, the same position you are? Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is definitely something that we didn't see ourselves um, at, you know, to be in line to wait for our food box um, to get help from, from our community and from, you know, the government in, in that regard. Um, I think it really just shows how how insecure we all really are. This is something that we have been hearing for years, that everybody is a, a check or two away um, from being uh, food insecure, for being um, uh, out in the streets. And I think that we're, we're seeing that right now, um, and not just um, in, in the housing situation, but also small businesses, and how much um, our government has not created the safety nets necessary um, for our for us to be safe in that regard. Um, I think that it's very clear that we need programs like Medicare for All, uh, where our health care is not a tied to our jobs, that we need the ability to have um, access to food 
and um, be able to have food security, especially in times of need. Um, we're seeing that the system is not set up to provide uh, people with food. We're seeing that there's food banks that are, are triple, quadruple, five times more uh, the capacity that they're able to handle. Um, people are in need and we don't have the ability to serve them. Um, in fact, like we're seeing that out here in the San Fernando Valley where I'm from, um, that we have a very much a lack of uh, food banks and um, services uh, for people in need. You've helped, speaking of lack of food banks, you've helped coordinate some of the mutual aid efforts in your area. How, how has that experience been? Yes, yeah, so right now we are working with um, Ground Game Los Angeles to create a, a net of services throughout the San Fernando Valley. Los Angeles is very, very big. Um, and the San Fernando Valley is, you know, pretty much half of, 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 the, of the, San Fern or the, the Los Angeles area. And so we are hoping to be able to be the San Fernando Valley uh, branch uh, for Ground Game Los Angeles is um, outreach for mutual aid. We are making connections um, with markets and a local church uh, to be able to try and maximize our efforts um, to service our community because what we're seeing um, here, example, um, in Sun Valley, we have a, a church that does a food uh, distribution and they're seeing about double um, what they're normally used to. So people are in need and um, you know what I am seeing too is the community coming together and um, and stepping up and really um, bringing their their resources in and, and 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 being able to facilitate aid. So that's what we're trying to do out here in the San Fernando Valley. Um, and um, like I mentioned, oh, we, it was mentioned before. I'm running for Congress, and we're utilizing our our network. Uh, mm -hmm. to be able to facilitate aid. So we have access to folks via text, uh, email, and phone calls. So we're trying to utilize those those uh, tools to be able to access people who might need help and to see if we can facilitate, coordinate, and uh, provide the assistance that they might need. Yeah, if there is one positive that's coming from this horrible situation is that people are realizing uh, that there there is a community around them and hopefully people are standing up uh, and and helping out with those who have the least in these in these tough times. Uh, speaking of activism, because mutual aid is a form of activism, in the, in the past you've been arrested in acts of civil disobedience, fighting against ICE and against our you know repulsive immigration policies. Why is that an important issue to you? And and also why choose arrest as as a tactic? Why do you feel that works? Well, you know, um, my parents were both undocumented when they came to this country. When I was born, um, they were un un in doc undocumented status and got amnesty in the mid 80s. Um, but we live with that fear. So I know exactly what it feels like to, to be scared that uh, a parent's not going to come home, even when they got, uh, you know, their, their uh, immigration status uh, fixed or what have you, um, we still had that fear because it, we just didn't feel safe for a long time. Um, so I know the feeling, the fear of being a, without a parent um, and just having that thought of me being out without my children is just absolutely heartbreaking and terrifying. And so um, we all know, or most of us know that these separations have been going on for a long time. These are not new to the Trump administration. These were already happening during Obama's yeah. uh, administration, but um, you know, we didn't, we we're not aware of it. So um, now with that we know and we're seeing it very clearly, um, I felt that I couldn't just um, stand by and not act. I, I do appreciate you mentioning that uh, so many deportations and separations were going on under Obama, and of course they've been ramped up under Trump. But like you said, the, me the mainstream media was not making a big deal out of it then, so a lot of people didn't know that it was uh, mm -hmm. happening until more recently. Uh, speaking, of, exactly. speaking of presidents, the two presidential candidates for the two biggest parties are both accused now of sexual assault and sexual harassment. One of them has publicly bragged about it, of course. And seeing as that's the reality we're in, you recently put out a statement saying you yourself are a survivor of sexual assault and you titled the post, Stop Asking Me to Vote for Accused, accused Sexual Predators. Can you talk about that post? Yes, absolutely. Um, I think that we can all agree that Donald Trump is a sexual predator. We have it on paper. We have it um, on video. Um, and, you know, the Republicans chose to have him be the nominee. 
Um, at this point, we have Joe Biden, who has also been accused of uh, being a sexual predator and uh, raping Tara Reid. And um, I do believe that these uh, allegations are credible. We are seeing that we have corroborating ex uh, um, evidence coming forth, um, really matching up with Tara Reid's story. And I believe that um, with the Democratic Party right now, you know, they, they actually created it within their bylaws the ability um, if a candidate a, during the primary did not clinch the nomination, did not get enough votes um, to get that nomination outright, then uh, the Democratic Party's uh, superdelegates have the apparatus built into it to um, replace him. You're also running for Congress in the middle of all of this. Uh, what do you feel are some of your solutions, as you were just listing, listing there, for all the problems we've gone through in this segment? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so like I mentioned, we are running for Congress here in California's 29th Congressional District. And um, the issues that matter across the country are the issues that matter uh, for, for us here. We're fighting for health care for all, Medicare for all. Uh, because we believe healthcare is a human right and it should not be tied to your job. Right now we're seeing that um, we have millions of people who have lost their health care. Um, we have millions of people who have lost their jobs and they have nowhere to go. Um, COBRA is way too expensive. Um, even the exchange is way too expensive. It's, 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 it's inhumane um, to not be able, to, in the richest country in the world, to be able to cover the basics of health care. Um, we believe in uh, a Green New Deal, a well-rounded Green New Deal, which will build up our crumbling infrastructure and move us from uh, you know, fossil fuels to green energy, at the same time provide jobs and provide uh, education um, and, the, and health care too. It's a well-rounded uh, Green New Deal. And if you have some time, take a look at our website, angelicaforcongress.com, and you can see what our plans are there. Um, and um, uh, tuition-free higher education, both um, in job training, then the trades, and um, college and university. Um, and of course, um, forgiveness of, of federal school loans. Um, I think it's just uh, absolutely cruel uh, to have students that start off their careers um, with such a burden of mm -hmm. such a huge debt you know, when I graduated uh, university, I had a big old, uh, you know, loan to pay off. And uh, right now I actually owe more than I did then um, yeah. because of, of all the interest. So um, it's just, you know, the basics really. And um, I think that that's something that that we still need to keep in mind and remember that the fight continues and it's not it was never just about Bernie. It was about us and change yeah. is, you know, happens from the bottom up. And that's what we need to focus. We need to focus now on, on the local races and support uh, your, your leaders that, that you, you, you trust and that you can believe in. Absolutely. Angelica Duenas, thank you so much. And uh, Angelica for Congress with the number four is uh, where people can find you, uh, dot com is where people can find you and learn a lot more. Thank you so much and uh, keep fighting out there. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have to go to a short break, but if you're stuck at home, Looking for something to do, you can check out my podcast, Fail University. And also, check out the free RT America app at portable.tv slash download. We'll be right back. When all truths seem wrong, when all rules just don't hold, and a new world that is yet to shape out, disdain becomes the etiquette, and engagement equals betrayal. When so many find themselves worlds apart, we choose to look for common ground. They're putting the bodies in 18 wheeler, y'all. Please stay inside. This is for real. The poorer population are dying more. Some of the wealthier neighborhoods, it's been far more contained and the numbers are much lower than some of the poorer neighborhoods. This is 
our empty city. It's pretty crazy. We're working with crematories outside of the state because they're just so inundated here. It's unlike anything I've ever seen. Welcome back. I'm Naomi Caravani, and I'm still not going to cry. Will COVID-19 drugs be available for everyone? Remdesivir, the drug that shows signs it could help the most severe cases of COVID-19, is made by a company with a shady history, Gilead. Gilead is the company known for life-saving drugs that treat deadly illnesses like HIV and hepatitis C, and they're also known for charging $1,000 for a pill. For $1,000? <laughs> that pill better be saving my life. And killing my worst enemy. It should come with a complimentary gun. <laughs> and a hitman, Larry. You buy a year's supply, you get two Larrys. This time last year, the maker of Gucci pills, Gilead, was facing a congressional hearing investigating the exorbitant price of their HIV drug. Truvada, or PrEP, treats and prevents HIV, making it a manageable illness instead of a death sentence. But it was also so expensive, only one in 10 patients in need could get it. So the list price is almost $2,000 in the United States. Why is it $8 in Australia? Uh, Truvada still has patent protection in the United States, and in the rest of the world it is generic. I can't comment on the price in Australia of the generic medicines, uh, but it is generically available in other parts of the world. Why are we in the U.S. paying retail prices when we invented Costco? This is America. It's one nation under rebate. But I guess not when it comes to drugs. We are paying 350 times the price of Australia for life-saving medication. This is because of patent protections. And what are we protecting these corporations from? Generics. In other words, competition. This is corporate welfare. We are shielding this corporation from the free market. Honey, tell us where the invisible hand touched you. And the bigger scandal is that we helped finance the research and development of Gilead's HIV drug. Dr. Lord, thank you for your advocacy here today. Is it true that the public invested $50 million to develop PrEP? Yeah, uh, that is correct. So taxpayers helped fund a drug that many taxpayers can't afford. Activists say that the number is higher than 50 million and say, we have a monopoly dominating the market and raking in money for what are actually government inventions. And we're having massive access issues because of it. Look, companies should be rewarded for their inventions, but if the medicine is our inventions made in our laboratories and tested on our monkeys, and it took a lot of monkeys. We locked them in there, and first they just wrote a bunch of sonnets. We can't use this. Taxpayer money has gone to waste. Anyways, taxpayers are paying twice now for the HIV drug that isn't even going to everyone who needs it. So the public is paying, we paid to develop PrEP. We paid to finance the publicly funded trials to develop this drug. Uh, we also pay and foot the bill with patient assistance programs. Also, the, as you noted, the existence of these, existence of these programs happened because of the public. And also we pay when the HIV epidemic gets spread as well. Um, very quickly, Mr. O'Day, you're the CEO of Gilead. Um, is it true that Gilead made three billion in profits from the sales of Truvada in 2018? Uh, three billion in revenue. She didn't mention the monkeys, but that's okay. To rein in the high price in a rare move, the Trump administration sued the company, saying the country owns the patents. This is crazy. Both Trump and AOC agree on hating something. The drug company must be just as evil as Nancy Pelosi. However, the Trump administration made a deal with Gilead, and the company agreed to donate a large supply of the drug, but that still won't be enough. Mr. Horn, uh, does it trouble you that the administration's plan relies so heavily on uh, the donation 
of free drugs from Gilead? Um, when we took a look at what happened when uh, we had our major innovator manufacturers who were donating um, drug uh, to low-income countries, um, that only got us so far. What was really required there was a reduction in price, you know, really that was spurred by a robust generic competition uh, to ensure equitable access and affordability uh, to our programs. And so it, let me be clear. I think the donation um, will help but it is not the, the panacea that we require. Uh, I just want Mr. O'Day to know that everybody uh, affords your donations and charity, but I think we'd actually prefer you to go back to old-fashioned capitalism and reduce the price. Old-fashioned capitalism is what we need, not this new kind of socialism for big pharma. They're trying to give us back the thing we helped create, so we forget we gave it to them. As we speak, the company is in court defending against two antitrust lawsuits for keeping its HIV meds at Dolce & Gabbana prices while driving out competitors. At the same time, everyone is asking the question, will Gilead price its coronavirus drug for public good or company profit? Let's translate this. Will Gilead let people die, as it has done in the past, to reward their investors, or will they take pity on us? and give us the medication. We're seeing a repeat of the HIV drug history with the rollout of the coronavirus drug. Keenly aware of negative publicity, the company agreed to donate 1.5 million doses of remdesivir in the U.S., which can be used for about 200,000 patients. And just like the highway robbery of HIV pills, Public Citizen estimated that U.S. taxpayers contributed $70.5 million to remdesivir research and development overall. We can't depend on the generosity of a company to get out of a pandemic. As we've seen, Gilead failed us in the past with the HIV pandemic. We see no noticeable difference on the numbers of people infected with HIV in the country, even though we have a medicine to prevent it. In most other countries, governments negotiate the prices of medication, but in the U.S., we don't. Well, there's an easy solution here. If you live in the U.S. and you get sick, go to Canada, buy your meds, come back for the freedom. And that's all I have for you right now. Let's go to correspondent Anders Lee with some mind-blowing old news. All the celebration of the 75th VE Day, marking the anniversary of the Allied Forces victory in Europe, is making me wish we had a VD Day to celebrate that time America launched the Cold War to achieve victory over democracy in its birthplace of Greece. Though that wasn't exactly the way it was pitched. Just a couple years after World War II, President Harry Truman put forth his vision of the post-war world in his speech to Congress. In the speech, he claimed that the world faced a choice. Nations could adopt a way of life based upon the will of the majority and governments that provided guarantees of individual liberty. Or they could face a way of life based upon the will of a minority forcibly imposed upon the majority. This latter regime, he indicated, relied upon terror and oppression. Now it sounds like he's suggesting that we pick the will of the majority option and not the terror and oppression one. But his actions would suggest otherwise. In that speech, he also asked Congress for $400 million in military aid to the Greek government. I know $400 million doesn't sound like a lot of money for one government to give to another, even in 1940s terms. But this is Greece we're talking about. They'd be lucky if they had negative $400 million. Huh? The trouble in Greece, according to Truman's ally Winston Churchill, started in 1941, when the National Liberation Front, known as the EAM, was born. The EAM and their military arm, the ELAS, fought hard against Nazi occupation. One would think this would make them natural allies with none other than the Allied forces, who were also trying to defeat Hitler. But the EAM didn't just want to liberate themselves from the Nazis. They also wanted to be free from the Greek monarchy, which was then in exile. They wanted a chance to practice that will of the majority stuff Harry Truman was so fond of. But instead of lending a helping Allied hand, Churchill commanded British officers to damage ELAS by all means available. They tried to poach its partisans by bribing them with gold. They financed small competitor organizations, including those who called themselves nationalist, 
but were in fact accomplices of the Germans. Although these operations were a serious assist to the Nazis, the EAM and ELAS persisted. They beat back the occupiers in many parts of Greece and even formed a counter-state institution known as the Government of the Mountains. I know that sounds like a libertarian techno-utopian village in Colorado, but the EAM was an explicitly communist organization that wanted the people of Greece to control the wealth they created. By September of 1944, they had forced the Germans out of Greece. You would think such a feat would have won them independence, but Churchill insisted that his pick, George Papandreou, take over as president of Greece instead. While the EAM were allowed symbolic posts in the government at first, they were prevented from running in elections when it became clear that they would win them. And when I say prevented, I don't mean they had to collect too many signatures to get on the ballot. I mean the EAM partisans were arrested, convicted, and subjected to unprecedented terror in the countryside. Terror! That's the very thing Truman asked for $400 million to protect the Greeks against. After Churchill was voted out of office in the UK, it fell on President Truman to keep Greek democracy safe from itself. Maybe there was popular support for the EAM, but his concern was that they were under the thumb of the notorious big, bad, and undemocratic... Oh, okay. It's just Joseph Stalin. For a second, I thought it'd be the mom for my big fat Greek wedding. Anyway, that must have been a difficult argument to make, considering the insurgency in Greece was supported not by the Soviet Union, but by Yugoslavia's Tito, who broke with the Soviet communists within a year. By 1949, thanks to American support, the Greek opposition was crushed. Economic turmoil and political repression would reign for decades. The Truman Doctrine speech set the stage for the Cold War, a 44-year-old long battle between the forces of democracy and the much more powerful forces pretending to care about democracy. For mind-blowing old news, I'm Anders Lee with Redacted Tonight. And that is the show. Thank you for joining us. Watch out for a brand new episode of Redacted Tonight tomorrow night. And check us out on youtube.com slash redacted tonight or the portable TV app. Also, you can check out my podcast, Fail University, a podcast where comedians talk about academic subjects the best they can. Thanks for tuning in. Good night and keep fighting.